tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Marshal Ophir McKnight climbed down from his horse and began to pick through the eerily silent camp. The travelers had picked a prime spot back away from the trail beside the creek that shared his given name. They had picketed their horses and built a small fire with a cook pot over it. The camp had all the markings of a family that was moving further west. From the location of their camp, he figured they were out of Reno and headed southwest toward either Carson City or more likely one of the smaller mining and logging towns on the shore of Lake Tahoe, probably Lunam. He'd called to the camp several times before entering it, but the only answer he got was from a whinnying of the horses as they complained of being too long on the picket line. Taking off his hat, he looked toward the east where the sun was just peeking over Mount Rose. Something felt wrong here, terribly wrong. These people should have been stirring long before now. They were less than a day's travel to Lunum or even Crystal Bay. He sniffed at the air and then winced. Hidden deep under the wood smoke, animal and scorched coffee smells, there was a pungent odor of an open grave. Thumbing the hammer thong on the Colt 1878, he wore in his hip. He called again. Hello, the camp! His only answer was the calls of the morning birds and the buzzing of insects. Carefully, he began searching the camp, looking for signs of life. A quick glance inside the wagon told him all he needed to know. Four human shapes were cocooned inside wooden army blankets, unmoving, and there was the stench of death and the grave about them. It set his stomach to churning. Holding back the bile that threatened his throat, he searched the inside of the wagon, careful not to touch the cocoons. He found a doll appropriate for a young girl and a small boy's hat. Double-checking the cocoons, he realized that there were at least two forms missing, and that was not a good sign. Climbing down from the wagon, he studied the dun-colored dry soil. There didn't seem to be any signs of trouble. He quickly identified at least eight different sets of footprints, two of which came directly into the camp and then left in the same direction. Intrigued, he studied them for a moment. One of the prints were male boots, expensive riding boots like he remembered wearing as a young lad way back a lifetime ago in Mobile, not what one would expect in the rugged Sierra Nevada mountains. The other set looked like working boots. He squatted next to the prints and ran his fingers just above their outline. Then, bending down further, he first flared his nostrils and then breathed in deeply. Again, there was an overwhelming odor of dead flesh, and an open grave, and not much else. Retrieving his horse, he followed the prince down to the creek and could see where they turned north to follow its banks and not crossing it. Entering a pine thicket, he suddenly caught a whiff of blood and death. Instantly, going on the alert, he looked around but saw nothing. He carefully picked his way through the thicket, following his nose. Perhaps fifty yards into the copse of trees... The steady buzzing sound of flies caught his attention. Looking up, he saw what at first he thought was a black mass of leaves, but soon realized it was a small human form draped over a low limb. A tiny bare foot was hanging from the bottom of the mass of flies. Looking around the area, he saw another mass of crawling insects on the ground. This time, only the small hand of a boy was visible. Ophir steeled his mind as he climbed down from the saddle and tethered his horse. With a quick leap and scramble, he climbed the tree with ease. Reaching the mass of flies covering the small body, he began to shoo them away with his hat 
until they could see the form of a young girl of about four years. Her body had been shoved into the fork of a limb. Her little neck was at an odd angle, and he could see where something had torn out most of her throat. Gently, he removed the body and scrambled down the tree and lay her on the soft pine needles. Then he turned his attention to the other mass, only to find the boy of about the same age. His neck, too, had been broken, and his throat ripped out. But his body had fared somewhat the worse for wear on the ground, where small animals could get to it. Ophir's soul raged at the thought of innocent blood being spilled so casually. He could feel the beast that resided in his soul begin to stir and pace. As his temper grew, so did the agitation of the beast, and now he had an idea of what he was dealing with. Placing the bodies across his saddle, he covered them with a blanket and led his horse out of the trees and back up toward the camp, knowing what he had to do. He found a shovel tied to the side of the wagon and set out digging two large pits in the ground. It was nearly noon when he was finished with that part, and he'd worked up a powerful thirst, a thirst he slaked from the water of the creek. Then, spreading some dry tinder at the bottom of each pit, he began to build a pyre made of wood from the surrounding trees, double-checking his work to ensure that it would burn hot enough to do what he needed without getting out of hand. He worked well into mid-afternoon. Checking the sky periodically, he watched the sun begin to slip lower into the horizon. He had to hurry, because sundown would make things far worse. When he was finished with that, he took a hatchet and sharpened four stakes he'd cut from a nearby rowan tree. Then came the hard part. Pulling the tarp from the wagon, he climbed up inside the first figure cocooned in the woodland blankets. Picking it up, he hopped down next to the pits, and with a stake in one hand, he rolled the form out of his blanket. The woman's flesh was pale, thin and nearly translucent, showing the outlines of the veins beneath it. She appeared to be in her late twenties with long blonde hair. He could see her eyes flicker back and forth under the white flesh of her eyelids. She cried a mournful wail of pain and sorrow that echoed across the valley, still mostly asleep, the pitiful thing that had once been a woman, a wife, and a mother, began to writhe and crawl toward the shadow of the wagon as its skin blistered and burned in the afternoon sunlight. Ophir stepped over it and drove the stake through its heart with a single thrust. Then, with the shovel he used to dig the pits, he separated her head from the body. Chunk! The burning and blistering stopped immediately, and the face suddenly had a peaceful countenance upon it. As he would expect, there was no blood in the body. He then gently lay the head on one pyre and the body upon the next. He repeated the process three more times before laying the body of the children upon the pyres. Saying a prayer to whatever god might listen, he set the pyres ablaze. Normally, such a fire would not burn long or hot enough to reduce the bodies to ashes. But he stood there, staring into the blaze, calling up the witcheries his father, his mother, his grandmother, and even his great-grandmother had taught him. Pouring his will into the flame, he watched as it grew hotter. He watched it burn orange at first, and then red, and finally white-hot, as he stood there making sure the souls of at least this family could find rest. He would not rest until he had found for them... The beast in his soul demanded no less. Kane Mortar lugged the last heavy box down the steps into the old Shipton house and looked around at his work. Five heavy wooden boxes that made Kane think uncomfortably of coffins lay scattered around the old root cellar, each one nailed shut. It had been hot and thirsty work, bringing them halfway up the mountainside to this old house that some foreigner had paid good money to buy. They then turned around and spent more good money to have that sick lawyer Dickerson 
hire a bunch of carpenters to come here and fix up the place. Cain Mortar was not a man accustomed to hard work, and to be honest, something Mortar avoided whenever possible. If he hadn't been desperate, he'd not have taken the job when it was offered to him by Dickerson. But Mortar was broke, and the pay was good. Three dollars for half a day's work to haul them boxes out there, put them in the root cellar, and lock up behind them. It was twice what he could expect out of the silver mine and a whole week of pay for nothing with one of the logging gangs. Couldn't beat that with a stick. Dusting his hands off, he noticed the sun begin to dip behind the western mountains of the Carson Range. A chill went down his spine as he watched the reds and orange and purples fly across the darkening sky, making it appear as if it was bleeding. Shrugging it off to the unexpectedly cool temperatures for September that they'd been having, he turned back and went back down the stairs to the heavy wooden table and lit the kerosene lamp there. Outside, the wind began to pick up, and he heard the sharp bang of a loose shutter against the side of the house. The old place had been abandoned, since the Shiptons had all up and died from the flu that came through about two years ago. They were buried out in the family plot, and nobody ever visited them. Wait, he seemed to have heard a voice at the edge of his hearing. It was as much a command as it was a request. Cain looked around the room to see who'd spoken, only to find nothing but the boxes sitting peaceably on the hard dirt floor. He glanced over at the lamp, and something about how the fire danced across the wick caught his attention. For long moments, he simply stood there, staring at it as it leapt and danced under the chimney like some fiery imp from hell. He didn't know how long he'd stood there, mesmerized by it, but when he finally looked up, the lengthening shadows had stretched into the eerie twilight of dusk. Shaking his head, he cursed himself for not paying attention to the time and reached for the lamp. Bam! The light in the lamp fluttered and made the shadows dance along the wall in time with the leaping flame as the door leading out of the cellar slammed shut. Feeling his heart pound in his chest, Cain grabbed the lamp and headed up the short pine stairs to the heavy gray doors. He pushed at them, but they were locked from the outside. A man-shaped shadow flashed across the slits between the gray weathered planks. Hey, let me out of here, Cain demanded. Wait. Again, the voice at the edge of his hearing said. A strange stillness came over the man that was Cain Mortar, and he found himself unable to move his feet. A small scratching came from behind him. He turned to investigate, only to see a bony hand reach out from under the lid of one of the boxes. Cain found himself mesmerized while the horrific form that pushed back the lid of the box emerged with the stillness of the dead. It was tall, thin, with a hooked nose and eyes that reflected the fiery red flames of hell. Bushy steel gray eyebrows with the foundation of a forehead that arched up into a thick head of hair of the same shade. A long mustache and a small pointed beard framed the cruel mouth with the thin lips and sharp canines. The tips of his ears came to fine points and he was dressed in a kind of suit Kane expected of rich dandies back east. It was all black, including his shirt, and the only bit of color about him was a small red pin on his tie. Some part of Kane's brain was screaming to run, to get the hell out of there, but his fate refused to budge as the man drew closer, seeming to glide across the floor without taking a single step. Kane's heart pounded in his chest as the man approached and smiled cruelly, displaying the pair of long, wolf-like fangs on either side of his upper teeth. Cain felt his body tremble as the man touched the side of his face with a cold, dead hand. This terrible sucking sound began to fill the room. Some part of Cain's mind screamed out in terror. It was well into the night when the deed was done. 
The family's belongings had been fed to the fire, like in the traditions of the ancient Vikings. Six crosses marked the pit where he had burned the bodies of the family, before spreading their ashes in the creek below. A fear didn't know their names, but the family Bible was for the Vordenberg family, so that was the name he put on the largest cross. He waited in the night, his own thoughts troubled by what he'd seen and done. Ophir had grown up in a Witchkin family and had been taught by both his grandmother, Mary Beaumer, and his great-grandmother, Catherine McNaughton, née Dubois, but various other Witchkin, so he had known what to do to destroy the things in the wagon. The question was, could he find the undead responsible for this before it spread so wide that it would take a miracle to stop it. Feeding and watering the two horses of the Vordenberg family, as well as his own, he sat back against his saddle and waited. His forty-five, his Henry, and his father's cavalry saber near at hand. He expected to have visitors again tonight, as he expected that the one responsible for what had happened to this family come and check on their work. It was just a few hours before sunrise when he saw something gliding silently through the trees, disturbing not a single leaf or pine needle. It was tall and thin, and wore a tin star on its vest and a six-shooter on its hip, and did not expect to be seen as it circled the campsite to see what had become of its kill. In life this man had been middle-aged, lean, and weathered by the elements, Evidently, he'd been the town sheriff somewhere nearby. In death, he was a washed-out image of his former self and had now taken to hunting travelers. Finally, deciding on the direct approach, the creature stepped out of the trees and called, Hello, the camp! Ophir smiled to himself and thought, There's one. He did not, however, answer. Hello, the camp! Creature called again. There's two. Just one more. Hello, the camp! The creature called out a third time. Ophir noted the sound of disappointment in its voice. Hello? Ophir answered on the third call. Who are you and what do you want? I'm Sheriff Plant from Lunum, and I'm looking for a missing family. Oh, really? He asked. Family got a name. Ophir watched the creature struggle for a name. Finally, it said, Jones. Ophir smiled and told him, I haven't met anybody named Jones on the trail, and I came all the way from Carson City. You got a name? I do. Care to give it to me? Ask me again, Ophir answered. What's your name? It finally asked. Once again disappointed. A fair McKnight, U.S. Marshal, he told him. Of course, that was only the name that Ophir had been using since he left Bontreville after the unfortunate events that had shattered his family. He, his uncle Teddy, and his grandmother all agreed that perhaps it was time for the McNaughton name to sleep for a while. So Ophir had changed it to McKnight, which is what McNaughton meant anyway. Can I come into the camp, Marshal? The creature asked, holding up its hands. If you can, he replied. And again the man asked, Can I come into the camp? If you can, Ophir repeated. You're not being very hospitable, the sheriff complained. Perhaps, Ophir told him, rising to his feet. His left hand concealed the saber behind his back, his right hovering over his forty-five. Dangerous times. You're so right. The creature growled. With lightning reflexes, the thing, masquerading as Sheriff Plant, drew its pistol and fired. Ophir hit the ground rolling and came up firing his colt twice, while the sheriff cocked his for a second shot. The first bullet ripped through the sheriff's chest, the second, however, caught him right between the eyes and blew out the back of his brain case. The vampire hit the ground, having never gotten off the second shot. Moving quickly before the vampire could put itself back together, 
Ophir stepped in and hacked through the back of its neck with a saber until its head rolled away. This time, the vampire began to crumble to dust in the cool night air. Ophir watched as the ashes and dust mingled in the rising heat from his campfire and sparked like lightning bugs rising in the night sky. Shaking his head, he couldn't help but think about the waste. He knew the sheriff was not going to be the last undead he was going to encounter. He knew that there was a second vampire out there, probably the one that made the sheriff. He could already feel the pull of the arcane, and it was coming from the direction of the town of Lunum. The beast in his soul growled at the thought. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.